Welcome everyone to another episode of The Reason for Now. Co-presenters are Theo and Angela. Hello. Angela, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good to hear. Good to hear. Now, what we're going to talk today about is post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. A lot of people have been asking me to do a podcast on this uh, because especially after lockdown and the sense of loss of control everyone had, it's very, very common. Um, and what we're going to talk about is, is there are different grades of PTSD. And PTSD, again, is just a label. The important thing is to understand what happens to people if they don't understand what's going on around them and they end up with processing blocks. Triggers? Would those be triggers? Tr or triggers, indeed. Okay. So, for instance, PTSD itself was first uh, defined in soldiers returning from the Vietnam War and officially recognised in the diagnostic system since 1980. And, of course, historically there was shell shock um, in soldiers in World War I. Um, and, unfortunately, some of those were even shot for, uh, for not going back into battle. But, of course, now we know it was a medical disorder. It's interesting what's considered a medical disorder against really what would be considered, I would have thought, understandable human behaviour. If you have witnessed something or been involved in something that threatens your life, why would you want to put yourself in that position again? I wouldn't even label it as PTSD, just simply a shocking experience. Surely our, our primitive brains would say, don't do that again. Common sense. True. But what about what about your duty to your country? So how do you weigh up duty to your country versus common sense? Mm, well, that's possibly a completely different discussion <laughs> beyond PTSD. Who who created the concept of duty to your country? What is that in reality? A soldier. So, so for instance, the duty of a soldier to their battalion or the rule to obey orders. Mm, I think... Um, the rule to obey orders, uh, again, at the expense of your uh, innate desire to protect yourself. So somewhere, somewhere, like if we go back to societal basics, uh, I would say that if something is threatening you or your family or your greater community, you would automatically rush to defend it. If you are being told to do something for the duty of your country, that's a different thing, isn't it? If you're not, if you're not intrinsically compelled to protect something in a moment, the other thing is an illusion in a way, isn't it? Yes, but uh, theoretically you're protecting your country. Yeah, but that it's a mind construct at that point. Yes. Either you are compelled to protect something immediately and you rush to do it, or you don't. But how many soldiers, though, unless they st stuck by the rules, would simply not go into battle or not go into war? I don't know. That would be really interesting mm -hmm. to know. And and the, the, the nuance, however, in terms of post-traumatic stress is that it is a recognised medical psychiatric condition. And one of the First of all, the requirement for post-traumatic stress to occur is that you have a experience that makes you terrified uh, and potential at loss of life of yourself or a loved one. Mm -hmm. The key thing is you feel out of control. And following that, you end up in a sense of hyper arousal because you haven't been able to process it. So you end up uh, not concentrating, sometimes not sleeping. Uh, jumpy with sudden noises called hyperacoplexia. Uh, and because you aren't able to process it, your mind keeps on trying to, uh, but then it blocks it. So things like flashbacks, which are like video clips occurring during the day or nightmares. And then the other thing is you avoid triggers likely to stimulate recollection. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you had a car accident, you will avoid getting into cars potentially. I've experienced exactly that. So um, I've been hit both off my motorbike and uh, cycling. Each time was from the same side, always from the left. Mm -hmm. So even um, I think the last time I was hit was maybe possibly around 15 years ago. 
the um, it's diminished, but still there'll be times when I'm going along and it feels like I can't process fast enough something that's happening on the left. So I will react sometimes when there's not even something to react to. Simply I've passed a, uh, an open road on the left and I expected something to happen, but there's nothing there to happen. So I, I do know what that feels like. What would cause someone not, not to process it then? Right, good question. So for that, there is there are there are two rules of human behavior. Mm -hmm. And the first rule is that every single organism with self-awareness has a level of arousal. Uh, colloquially, we call that anxiety. But if you just call it central nervous system arousal, why? Because the more alert you are as a caveman, the more likely you are to escape predators. The more alert and driven you are, the more likely you are to be driven to get your basic need to survival. Conversely, if you are asleep, you're going to be eaten and you're not going to be getting your basic need to survival. So why do we label that sense of arousal as anxiety? Well, it depends if it's causing you a problem. So, oh, I see. so if, it, if, if it's interfering with your daily functioning and causing you distress, mm. then it'll be labeled as different types of anxiety, including the anxiety of arousal and PTSD. So many labels. So many labels. <laughs> That's right. Um, so the key thing is if something un unspeakably horrible happens to you, then you can't process it. And our minds are simply filing mechanisms. In other words, we have to be able to process something because then we know how to respond in future to the same situation. If we haven't been able to process it, then we will either avoid that situation or respond in the wrong manner. But you'd want to avoid a situation that had caused you a load of stress, something that almost killed you. You'd want to avoid it, right? Well, theoretically, but not if there's no more danger, such as getting back into a car or. Um, but there is danger. Th th there is, but it's an everyday manageable situation. And in fact, um, uh, we know that the risk in cars is unbelievably low. Um, so the, the, the key thing to understand is if it interferes with your daily life versus you are fully functional and just taking a reasoned argument. So what you mm. what you what you're defining now is the, the difference between logic and illogical. So wherever there is an emotion logic gap, what is that? I know I shouldn't feel like this anymore, but I can't help it. So. Um, and again, nobody else will explain to you this clearly. It's a bit like a phobia again. Mm. You know, you can have phobia about, in quotes, silly things, can't you? Um, I know that shoe isn't going to harm me, but I can't help being anxious about that shoe, let's say. Um, so I know I shouldn't feel like this, but I can't help it. I understand my anxiety is excessive and unreasonable mm -hmm. versus um, you have to you're going to go into you're going to swim with sharks. Now, that is logically dangerous. So to, in order to swim with sharks, you need education and tools, such as a shark cage. Um, however, if you give someone education and tools with a phobia, they'll say, well, well, well what am I going to do with this? I'm just afraid and I know I shouldn't be afraid, but I can't help it. Yes, I understand that. I guess the complication, and certainly in my experience, is after five times of being hit on the left side, it no longer seems to be something not to fear. It definitely must be something to fear if you look logically at the, t you know. Why would you be hit on the left side all the time? Though? <clears throat> Car doors. Right. So you will go out, uh, cycle outside a car. Oh, yes, of course. You've got yeah. a car behind you saying, go closer to the cars. You try and edge in because you've got an angry motorist. Then someone on Boom. the, yeah. So how do you avoid that without annoying someone so either the car behind you just has to be happy to go at the pace of a cyclist up a hill uh, or in those moments I chose to go to the left the other ones were cars coming up from the left now why I happen to be in two instances have the same um, hit from the same side I don't know that because right. again um, it could be just exceptionally unlucky yes um, or there is a there's a physical reason such as impaired field of view on the left hand side let's say let's yes but whatever if we could look at the figures logically 
it won't change my experience, no matter how much logic you apply to that right, because uh, although that's that's basically what you're saying, and this isn't it that you can't take logical numbers and apply them to someone with PTSD because they'll just keep saying, and I've got actually several other examples of that, which I won't go into because it just seems like I'm the PTSD queen at that point. <laughs> but um, it can be incredibly frustrating when you are having a conversation with a medical professional, whether that's somebody in your field or whether that is a, a GP or whether that's someone about to remove your appendix. And if you explain to them where your fears come from or your experience, which must have some validity, right? But the response is, well, there's no clinical reason that would happen. It's like, okay, but I've literally just told you my experience. So regardless of what your clinical experience is, or the, no, sorry, regardless of what the clinical reason is, my lived experience doesn't align with your clinical data. So can you explain the difference or why that would be? Normally the, normally the conversation shuts down at that point. And then unfortunately from that point, as a patient, or if, yeah, then you lose trust because you're dealing with someone that is only speaking in data and numbers and it doesn't align with your lived experience and and this and and the difference is too vast to be explained or thought, talked through and they're not trying to understand you they're not they're not trying to figure it out well they might be maybe but they just can't yeah perhaps the wrong model. Um, yeah so and how can somebody who deals in a clinical field and a clinical field means they can't have everyone's experiences. The experiences of people that they have exist only as data points on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And they can't, unless they have had this specific experience themselves, there's going to be a good chance they're not going to be able to create the right uh, communication with the person at that point to give them reassurance or perhaps to help them move on because there's quite a solid uh, disconnect. Yeah, or, or they, they don't understand PTSD, for instance. So there's no reason for you to be feeling like this. So therefore, clinically, you shouldn't be feeling like this. Again, that undermines the person's lived experience, right? Exactly. Yeah. But that that's exactly the point. They don't understand. And that's a real shame because then you get put off and you lose trust, as you say. Will they ever be able to, will they ever be able to understand, though, because... It takes um it takes a very empathetic person to be able to put themselves in someone else's shoes. I don't know how many people can do that. We all live in our uh, shell of perspective, as it were. If you're truly empathetic and can put yourself in other people's shoes, actually it's quite a raw place to live. You are too open to sort of all possibilities, as it were, which can be hugely disorientating. The, well, again, well, this, there is a, a skill and a practice to empathy. So uh, if, you, if it happens absolutely naturally, and as you say, it, it, it's very raw, or uh, it's a skill that you practice. Mm. So you listen. The key, the key thing with empathy is showing that you've listened and understood. Mm -hmm. um, but what you, what you said, talked about right now is perspective. Well, is, is that true empathy? Or is that the illusion of understanding that you're just talking about uh -huh. there? Because Good true point. empathy, true empathy, putting yourself actually in the person rather than just listening and appear to listen and feeling sympathy for the person, I think are two different and things. Empathy, well, sympathy is different to empathy, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you're right. The, the the thing is to be authentic, you're going to have to have listened in detail and then taken your own emotions out of it. So that you're not applying judgment to what Correct. you've heard. Exactly. I don't know many people who can do that. It's a, it's a rare skill, yeah, 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 which is yeah. why there are books written about it and courses yeah. on it. Um, do you think it's something you can learn? Yeah. Really? Uh, Interesting. It, it, for a lot of people, not everyone. Mm. It's a good point. Because I lot. think there are some people that uh, are naturally empathetic and yes. I don't mean that as a judgment yes. I don't mean that they are better or worse than anyone else it's like there are people that are naturally logical I'll give you the They're, you know the extreme is the autistic so they, they they will not be able to be empathic um, you can algorithmically get them to express empathy so they can get on better with people but you can't actually 
get them naturally to do it. No, it's a, it's the illusion of empathy, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's a res- good. it's a signaled response. If you respond saying this type of thing at that time, that person feels connected to you because you've given the right nicety. Or if but... their face makes that that crease, then it means they're happy or sad. Yeah. But just going back to the mm. PTSD side of Sorry. things. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Because that was that's interesting. The if we go even more simply, then then a processing block can simply be a misperception. You see, the, the key thing to understand is the mind avoids anything that causes anxiety, but it could be big or little anxiety, mild or severe anxiety. Um, and therefore, you will tend to go through life with these little avoidances of things that that um, caused you psychological pain, or you may misperceive something. And then what happens is you will hold on to that misperception because it can be quite painful to admit to yourself that you misperceived something. So again, you have to go through that pain. And and that's why I also say people only have real clarity of mind twice in their lives. First, when you're born, and second, after you've had really good therapy. <laughs> so what they've done is they've also shown that, that uh, if you get university students from Yale, and there's a professor called Professor Pennybecker, and all he got them to do was to was to write about uh, mildly negative experiences they'd gone through. And that group that did it were better in every single way. Physically, their ECGs, their blood pressure was better, and psychologically, they did better in their exams. So what we're dealing with in terms of, in terms of uh, processing blocks is your arousal is highly mediated by cortisol and cortisol is is essential for survival it mobilizes you but if it's chronically raised it's it's the grim reaper it breaks things down so these guys had lower cortisol levels okay because they wrote about the yeah, experience what, and what it. so the writing yes was the process the, so it got it out of their mind and externalized they, into a solid place yeah the, well, what they did is that they, <clears throat> it forced their mind to think it through, you see. So anything which is, has gone, uh, and I shouldn't feel like this, but I don't know why, all you've got to do is think it through to process it. But because you avoid anxiety automatically, subconsciously, it's very hard to do that by yourself. Now, that's okay for mild things, but for very severe things which cause you extreme anxiety, it's almost impossible to do by yourself, which is why you need a professional to do it. And the the classical way of, of uh, dealing with post-traumatic stress or phobias is cognitive behaviour therapy, where you you literally talk it through. Oh, I've done that. It yeah. doesn't work for me. <laughs> and you keep on talking it through. But the, the, Until I want to throttle the person making yeah. me continue because it just feels like you really don't understand what I've gone through. We've talked about this so many times now. It hasn't improved things. And you get upset, don't yeah. you? Well, so what what I've seen, you see, is because therapy sessions are time limited, you might, first of all, you're not going to want to start talking about it. And if you eventually start talking about it, then the bell goes. <laughs> and now you're in an aroused state. So what you're effectively doing is re-traumatizing yourself. You can get worse. But now you're applying the trauma to the person trying to help you, the person that you've yep. tried to see. And then three psychotherapists or cognitive behavioural therapy, you know, and people down. But, and then you're just like, this doesn't work. Correct. Those people don't know how to fix me. That's a whole other level of thing that just doesn't work. Well, they didn't. So did you, they? But you've literally now created, one, one has created, yeah, another... But these are just all examples that we collect as we go through life, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we become exaggerated, happy or grumpy old people, right? Cynical and all that. The next next step was a a psychologist called Shapiro. And she went for a walk in the woods one day with lots of problems on her mind. And at the end of a walk, she realized she'd solved them. And she thought, how did that happen? Was it maybe the parallel tree trunks somehow distracting my gaze (laughs) into my pretectal nucleus to help me process things. <laughs> so she developed a therapy where she would move her finger as a surrogate tree trunk in front of people's eyes. So it's not hypnotism, it's the surrogate tree trunk. And she'd get them to think about it and rate it, rate their distress, and they would get better. 
And when I first heard of this, I thought it was quite frankly, hocus pocus, right? But I started losing patience to people who'd been trained in eye movement desensitization reprocessing, which is EMDR. So I got trained in it. Then I went to a course with Paul McKenna on neurolinguistic programming, NLP. And he did something similar on a female member of the audience. So I went to her in the lunch break at the buffet and I said, did that work? She said, yes, it did. How did it work? She said, well, I got the sense he was trying to distract me and encourage me. And I got it. So what happens is distraction distracts the cortex from actively suppressing the anxious thought or experience. And so you can have your finger. In fact, what they found in, in the research is that you don't need a waggling finger. You'd, you can use a patana hammer on the knees. You can even use uh, alternate flashing lights. It is the distraction that matters. Oh, that's interesting because my understanding of that when I did it, is that you have you have created almost in your brain thought groove patterns that you can't move outside of, like, no. you know, that, that's how it was described I, to I, me. And so that by getting you to hold that thought um, and then do that with your eyes, because eyes trigger different parts of your um, brain well, as see, it works, you know, you, you go up you, to remember, you go down there to create. So if you go back and forwards to do that whilst thinking about it, it's almost like you're crisscrossing across it. That was the explanation I was Overly given. Overly complicated, yeah, yeah. hocus pocus, actually, that one. Um, it happened to work, but the wrong reasoning. And indeed, with some of the fear of flying courses, people will sit and they will touch. They're told to touch different parts of their body. Um, and I think it's the same principle. Which it's, it's also down to the tapping. There's this whole tapping thing that you can now do. It's a distraction. And then you do tap, 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 tap. Although just, I would go back to the original point going, I think everyone would benefit from going for a, for a long walk through trees. I, I mean, I think potentially she got to her uh, conclusion, which may not have been a conclusion at all because you're completely undermining well, see, also how incredible being in nature is. <laughs> well, well, that's also what I tell people. If they've gone through something minor um, or, it, you know, it could even be moderate, is I say, put yourself into in a place where you have a bit of mild distraction and make sure you try and think about it. So it could be going for a walk with a little bit of stuff going on around you. Not too much because it you have to be able to have a train of thought going on. It could even be in a, in a coffee shop where little tinkerings around you and you'll find that you start processing things. You could even go for a swim if you're fairly fit and just don't swim too much or a jog, the same thing. But you can't do something that requires your entire focus, such as weight training or sprinting or anything like that. It needs to be something which gives you a mild distraction. Or something that you can do almost automatically at some level. That's it, exactly. Yeah. And and so what I do in turn what what I did is I've combined and and distilled uh, post-traumatic therapy or trauma therapy. Uh, you can apply it to any processing block. Could be phobias, could be obsessive compulsive disorder, um, even writer's block. Okay. Um, so the first thing I do is I explain everything to the patient. Not why, because it ha what their symptoms have occurred because they were put into a feeling of not being in control. So I'm going to explain everything. You are in control of everything you're doing. You understand how it's going to work. And I get you to stand in a power posture because the power posture, head up, shoulders back, reduces within two minutes your cortisol by 20%, raises testosterone by 20%. Apparently even smiling, even just, smiling. just choosing to smile mm -hmm. will can give you a state change, even yes. if you don't. If you're even if you're not authentically smiling, yep. similarly with laughter, like there's a whole laughter therapy, right? Mm -hmm. That even if you're inauthentically laughing, even if it's a forced laughter, Correct. it will still start a state change that you may be able to snowball which, into which, an actual. Which is one of the concerns with Botox, because there's what? a lot less there's a lot less facial expression, oh so my gosh, does it so... make you depressed? No, gosh, well that's a thing, isn't it? It is a thing. So the. the the thing to do is you stand in the power posture. I then explain breathing because when people get anxious, they hyperventilate, which blows off carbon dioxide and actually makes them anxious. <gasps> can't so, have that in our carbon dioxide like world, can we? Indeed. If we're getting rid of cows, people can't be heavy breathing. <laughs> indeed. So, so what you do is you breathe more slowly and into your tummy. And what we then do is we use a mirror 
And it's one of the only things of Freud that I think is makes any real Don't sense. They're still alive. Well, no, I'm yeah. joking. Well, it's, what it does is it's self-awareness. <laughs> oh, I see. So, for instance, when's the last time that you looked in the mirror into your eyes and asked yourself how you felt about something? Yeah, the mirror is something I avoid. No. Lots of people do because it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but the mirror massively accelerates your self-awareness. Mm. Um, and in fact, the first time I was I. Uh, I'd, when I just developed this technique, I'd sent a patient who'd had awful uh, childhood abuse uh, to a specialist with, in EMDR, in abuse. And uh, she was struggling, wasn't getting better. So I said to her, well, I've developed my own more distilled uh, mechanism with a mirror and with the power posture. And my distractions, I, I tap on the left shoulder, always the left shoulder, uh, so I can manualize it. And we did it with her and it worked. She said, this is this is better. It's mm. more effective. Mm. Um, so you get the patient to stand in the power posture, looking at themselves in the mirror, and you distract them, tapping on the left shoulder, and you get them to think about what it is that caused them the trauma or the phobia. But you then give the patient freedom because you might tell them something and their mind might find something else. And then you say, Think about it as photorealistically as you can. Tell me how distressed you are. That's got to be, though, <laughs> a challenge in itself. It is. Because it is. by definition, they're not going to want to think about it. That's right. But what they're doing, by explaining it to them, they're going into it because they want to sort it out. But I also, it's a good point you raise because there is something that happens if they get too distressed they might say, look, this is too much for me. I don't want to do it. So what I also explain to them is you may get very distressed. And if you want to stop, you can. But if you stop, it's a bit like the end of those CBT sessions in an arousal state. You run the risk of re-traumatizing yourself. But if you continue, I promise you, you'll get better. Well, I mean, in a way, that could be a weighted threat to some people that might challenge them too far. If you're saying you can cure yourself now, if you do, if you go deeper into it. But they but if choose. You, you see, the, the, the most important <clears throat> thing is their choice. And what I will tell them also is if I see them getting distressed, I'll, I will give them the option before they bail. I'll say, do you want to stop? But remember, if you stop, you might get a bit worse. But if you continue, I promise you'll get better. Nobody has stopped, but one person did take a break and then continue afterwards. What if they can't? What if they can't engage in the thought? What if they can't get there to bringing it to be real because they're because avoiding it's so awful. it? Because yeah. they keep even if it's not so awful, it's interesting not to apply any judgment on severity of the things that have caused people's PTSD because it's each one's level of severity, so, whatever has triggered them. Has, some people mm. do struggle to engage. You're absolutely correct. Um, but they all eventually do. Some people struggle, but they all eventually do. I know. I th I'm pretty sure I would struggle. Mm. I know that I would try and get to that point, and then thinking I was getting close to it, and then the monkey mind would take me off track. And even if I wanted to make the change, I just have had a repeated experience where I tried to get to that place. Yes. I know I self hijack. And, and I know I self-hijack and I can't stop myself self-hijacking and I see it going off and so I'm like, is, bring that back. Occasionally, very, very occasionally, uh, some people will benefit from a little bit of clonazepam or it's like a diazepam-like thing, but not too much because obviously you don't want to go into it super, super calm. You want to experience the distress. But I should, I should also say, and it's really, really important, that you can only process something down to the baseline your brain is currently in. Therefore, if you're in a clinically anxious state, okay, then you can't really process, okay, because you're in, you're already in a clinically right. anxious state. Right, yeah. So you can so that's an excellent point. You can you you need to be clinically well, but just just in quotes, right, have the PTSD or the phobia. So in other words, if you're not thinking about the trauma if you're not thinking about the phobia, you're generally okay. Are any of us generally okay? <laughs> you're, 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 wait, you're roughly where you want to be within reason, okay? Sure, um, yeah, yeah, sure. But, you know, I can see, especially if that's your profession, people are not going to come to you in that state. 
they they, they come to you with a problem and exactly then, and then you might have to diagnose a ptsd and probably they come to you in a in, in a hi nice mm. to meet you got my good professional nicety mm. thing you know we kind of generally unless we are super in a high state of stress we generally still can pull it out of the bag upon meeting someone new or whatever to to present some form of oh yeah you know but, but so. then of course we'll go into it and uh, and then mm -hmm. it'll come out um and there was there was actually one gentleman who had a uh, an, a, an obsessional thought um that he was a paedophile uh, and of course he wasn't uh, but that was his obsessional thought, which is what I call the illusionary predator, because OCD thoughts are typically negative and they're the illusionary predator um, versus an OCD compulsion, which is an illusionary need. Um, and I said to him, I'm not sure whether you have a clinical anxiety disorder because you're so distressed about this. So what we did is we did the reprocessing, fixed it, it disappeared. I said, if you're clinically anxious, it will, it will gently come back, in which case you will need some medication such as escitalopram, which is a serotonin specific reuptake inhibitor type of medication. And that goes on to other ways of treating it. So some people do need um, to take medication, but it's the minority of people and they will take the medication and it, they may then get completely better or they'll take the medication and then benefit from the reprocessing. Or, in my experience, they'll take the medication and it doesn't, and, and their life gets worse. It has other side effects. So I'm, I'm really cautious. Well, you're you you're know, right. Or, uh, yeah, because it's not ideal. No. Uh, and in fact, there is superior types of medication which have been held back for years, probably because the pharmaceutical companies um, won't make money because they can't. Are we talking about them. like psilocybin and yes. things like that? Well, the old hippies were right. <laughs> psilocybin is, is actually uh, currently oh. getting a product license for post traumatic stress uh, and, and indeed for clinical depression. I'm assuming that'll be a synthesized And for addictions, by the way. But it'll be a synthesized version, won't it? Because, well, yeah. they, they, well they, it wouldn't get, unless it can be commoditized and unless it can be um, a dose. Or done in a, in a fancy Don't preparation. Yeah, so, yeah, for yeah, instance, yeah. ketamine, the, the horse tranquilizer, uh, is is now licensed as as a as a second or third line for clinical depression. You can give tablets of it, but the pharmaceutical company have pro have have uh, produced s ketamine nasal spray. So that's what they've managed to patent. Um, now, there's there's also another treatment called uh, 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 transcranial magnetic resonance. Uh, which is simply applying magnets to different parts of the brain. And that also seems to work in PTSD. Oh, thank goodness we've moved on from lobotomies. Or in, indeed, is it indeed. trepanning? <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the key thing, there's, there's, there, there will be something that will help you. Mm. Um, there, well, there is an, an additional thing to mention, which I should have mentioned already, as opposed to, in addition to serious traumas, in addition to mild unpleasant experiences that give you processing blocks. There is also the concept of chronic adversity. So it could be bullying at work. And that is called a prolonged duress stress disorder. Um, and it is something that's used in uh, in uh, tribunals if you, if you make a claim against your employees, if you've been bullied at work, for instance. That, I mean, I just want to make a note that we had hail outside and I'm wondering if that's going to be picked up on the microphone. So just in case. The oh, listeners. That's true, isn't it? Amazing. Yeah. Uh, Only in London. Only in the UK. You get sun in the morning, you uh, get, then you get drizzle and hail at lunchtime. Well, literally, we had sun 30 minutes ago, but I think it's going to pick that up. So um, going back to what you were saying, though, because we started off by saying uh, <laughs> lockdown and PTSD, but uh, it's incredibly common. About 9% of the population prior to lockdown was said to have some kind of PTSD. But research with lockdown said about 80% of people have PTSD. And to give you an example, ladies who give birth, at least 30% of those come away with PTSD. And if you think about the fact that you then have arousal and you have avoidance, you can see how that would impact on their personal relationships as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, we could we could go completely off on a tangent with the giving birth thing because 
obviously we give birth in a very different way these days than we did historically. It's uh, It has become almost pre-getting pregnant. A lot of women are already... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> ..are already... Um, Concerned and worried, so you have a you have a you have a trauma prior to the birth. Yeah, almost. I'm, I think maybe the our sound is going to be impaired. Our sound yeah. quality. So, well, so let's wrap it up here. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again shortly with another riveting topic. Thank you, Angela. All right. Thank you.